after today. You'll get some more tips, techniques you can use, or some habits to change to help you, to help support you. Now, I am all for all of these relaxation techniques. And we tell you a lot of times to do this, to light a candle, to breathe, to, well, we're going to tell you to breathe again today, but, you know, to, to uh, basically self-care. And what we want to talk about today is that a lot of these tips and techniques, they're not enough on their own right now. Uh, the type of anxiety that most of us are feeling is a much deeper and more powerful anxiety than just normal stress. And we also recognize that not everyone is feeling that way, but the odds are you're somewhere in a spectrum of feeling a little bit anxious periodically to feeling low level anxiety all of the time to feeling super anxious at certain times. And that's really what we want to address today. So we're going to start with understanding that connecting on a human level, the way we do in the work that we do is really a double edged sword. So there's nothing, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing our clients flourish, right? And to know that we're an instrument of that, that we're supporting them. But we also support our clients in dark and frightening times, and we're asked to help carry their burdens, right? So now more than ever, we are asked to hold a lot. Now, your clients are scared. They're stressed out. Many of them, um, they may... Uh, Maybe their partners have lost their jobs. Maybe they're suffering from postpartum depression in the midst of all of this. Maybe they have other children at home. And again, they can't possibly, they can't see their families or basically they can't find a moment of peace like many of us, right? They unburden on you, however, because you are their support system or they're maybe desperately asking you for help or advice. And of course, the challenge here, the biggest challenge is that you may be struggling with the exact same things whether it's your own burdens, your fears, anxieties. You, you may also have children underfoot. You may also be uh, worried about your family members and not being able to connect in person. So all of that is creating this sort of environment of anxiety. So first thing I want to tell you is however you feel, it's okay. Um, anxiety, stress, and feelings of overwhelm are really natural. It may feel unnatural, but it's absolutely normal during a time like this. Natural disasters are considered traumatic events. And so depending on where you are on the spectrum, it's going to affect how you're affected, right? So you want to start with having self-compassion and being very gentle with yourself right now. And that's not a trait many of us um, remember to practice. So people are processing and reacting to this disruption in a variety of ways. So you might feel hyper-emotional, you might feel numb, you might feel nervous, you might be in denial, you might find that maybe some days you're less motivated or you're having trouble focusing. That's all okay. And it's important that you allow yourself to feel however you're feeling. Now, of course, if at any point you feel that you've moved beyond just, I would call like typical um, or, or normal anxiety during a, a crisis, then of course, you if you feel like you're slipping into any sort of depression, then you want to get help right away. So this is not for that. This is for the general anxiety and stress that most of us are feeling now. So we're going to start with self-compassion. And research shows that people who practice self-compassion are less likely to be depressed, anxious, and stressed, and more likely to be happy, resilient, and optimistic. This is simply treating yourself with kindness. And resiliency and optimism are going to become more and more important with every passing day of this pandemic. So one of the things that you can do is try opening up with, about your struggles during staff meetings or during supervision. Um, share feelings of doing things like dropping the ball or snapping at your kids or confessing to, I haven't eaten pizza every night. Having a little cheese it problem, goldfish problem. I don't know what the cheesy crackers are, but you know, we're doing things that maybe we wouldn't do as much or, or on a regular basis. And again, that's okay. Be kind to yourself. Not, not long-term. We want to take care of ourselves, but when you have those moments, first of all, don't judge yourself. And secondly, share it with other people because it helps everybody understand that they're not alone in doing some of the things that they're doing. Also in vulnerability, there's a connection, right? That's the connection that's going to help us get through is to understand we are all going through the same thing, perhaps in different ways because of our circumstances, but we are all together even though we're separated. The next thing I really want to really emphasize is give yourself a break. 
everything may feel hard right now. Working feels hard. Parenting feels hard. I know for me, shopping is just a nightmare. I don't like it. It feels difficult. It feels challenging. If you're feeling disappointed for how you're handling things, then you need to give yourself a break. And you need to really remember, no one has done this before. Even in prior pandemics or epidemics or shutdowns, they weren't for this long. They weren't this intense. We didn't have all of the other things in life going on that were already so stressful. So we are doing this for the first time. We're all in a situation where we've been asked to work, run our households, parent, and, uh, parent, support clients, support maybe other friends and family, and take care of ourselves all at the same time under unsettling circumstances. So of course we're gonna struggle, and of course we're gonna fall short of our expectations. There's just no way around it. So it's of the utmost important that we really keep moving forward as we move forward to keep our expectations in check and to be very gentle with ourselves. And we need to be gentle with ourselves first. Remember, the better we are, right? The better we're feeling, the more we have to give. And right now we're being asked to give a lot. So I want you to remind yourself of a few other things. One is I want us to stop saying now we're working from home <laughs> because basically that doesn't recognize the unsettling circumstances we're all working in. Tons of people work from home before this, right? So the, you know, hackers sitting, you know, on, on, laying on the couch with their laptop, that's working from home, like the, the typical image. That's not what we're doing. These circumstances are not normal and our productivity may not be normal or consistent yet. Of course, we have to get there, and many people are, and I commend you, but at the same time, even the most productive person may have their days where they're just struggling. They just have a hard time. That's when our emotions kick in, and we start going through anxiety, and then it's hard to focus. So just check your expectations. If you are consistently not producing, you're not able to get motivated or produce the work that you need to produce, then that is an issue, and then you need to take action. Of course, first talking to your supervisor, but if it's you're pretty good you know, maybe Monday you start off okay, Tuesday by Wednesday, you're a little shaky, Thursday there's some new announcement and you can't focus at all, Friday you get back on track. That's normal. I also want you to stop saying you are homeschooling your children. And that's because if you're expecting to replicate your child's experience at school, it is not possible. You cannot possibly be a full-time teacher and a full-time fill in the blank of your role at the same time, that's two full-time jobs on top of what you're doing in the evenings, right? So um, I liked this, Rebecca Schrag Hirschberg suggested using this language. And, it, and it's not negative, this is just reality. It's gonna ease the pressure you're putting on yourself. You are stuck at home due to a global crisis and doing your very best to see that your children's schooling doesn't come to a sudden total and grinding halt. That's parenting, right? So start thinking of it this way when you begin to judge yourself because you can't keep up with the kids or you can't even understand their homework depending on their age. It's okay. That's not your full-time job. And then finally, and again, you can tell this is unusual times because you would never normally hear me say this, but you don't always have to find the upside. If you're able to see it, if you're able to find the positive in the situation, then that's wonderful. And of course, we always encourage gratitude. It's very good for your mental health. Um, but if you can't always find a positive in every situation right now, that's okay. Don't feel bad about it. Give yourself permission to just feel however you're feeling. And if in that moment, you're hearing something that's just irritating you because it's just way too happy, that's okay. Ignore it in that moment. Ignore it for a while. Just ignore anything that doesn't resonate for you. Again, what you're watching for here is not these moments of feelings or reactions or whatever it is. What you're looking for is a pattern. If you, if you can't find anything on any day to feel positive about, then of course that is a sign that you need to get further help. But if you're just going up and down, it's, we're, we're all on a roller coaster right now. That's okay. Don't, don't beat yourself up because you can't find something happy in the situation. There's a lot that there's not to be happy about. There are things we can be grateful for, which we'll talk about, but just again, take some pressure off of yourself. Now, having said, you don't have to find the happy. <laughs> While all of our feelings and emotions are of course valid and understandable, we cannot stay in this state of anxiety for an extended period of time. So I want you to start thinking that this is not a sprint. It is definitely a marathon and it may be a very long one. 
So we need to accept how we feel right now and we need to be kind to ourselves as we adjust and recognize that we've experienced a major disruption to our lives, major. But we also need to accept that this is no longer an event. Like the event maybe would have been the day we all got sent home, right? Or the day that they announced the shutdown or the day the, you know, the numbers started climbing. It, it, there's multiple events, um, but it's not an event anymore. This is, it's a fundamental change in the way we live and work. And it's going to go on for an undetermined amount of time. Just like you, I hope it's not a long time, but some of the projections, projections are showing it could be at least in some way over a very long period of time. So it's time for us to stop waiting for things to go back to normal. And I know I was doing that for the first, it's been over a month now, but I was doing it for the first like probably three weeks. Okay, well, okay, we'll just wait it out and it'll pass. It's not going to pass. So we're probably never going to return to completely what we think of as normal, but we will get back to something close to it. And we need to stop waiting even for that to happen because it's just going to take too long. And if we're waiting, we're not doing what we need to do for ourselves and for other people. So we want to start shifting our mindset to accept it is what it is. And the most important step to regaining our well-being is to really recognize that. We don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and you probably don't either, but we certainly don't know what's going to happen May 15th, or now I've heard the date June 8th to you know, tossed around, and in the fall and winter, and in 2021. So let's just accept that right now, we are going to start normalizing this, whatever this is for each of us, so that we can get back to living and not just waiting. Now, another very important factor here, and we all do this, is to start recognizing when stress, when we're, we're self-inflicting the stress. And of course, I'm talking about our thoughts. So this is a strange time. It's uncertain. We all know our brains don't like this. And there is this ever-present external stressor whether you hear it on the news or whether you go to a store or whether you take a walk outside and everybody's got masks on, it triggers stress. But consider how much your thought patterns may be contributing to that sense of uneasiness as well. So think back on the day and try to take in inventory on how many times you've stressed yourself out. Obsessively thinking about certain topics, replaying the events of the day, which you know we tend to replay the negative ones, thinking about alternative choices you could have made, dwelling on the past, feeling anxious about the future, those are all thoughts and we can actually start taming them down. Um, I'm doing it sometimes and it's crazy stuff. Like I'm getting low on a supply of something. Then it's, there's this whole obsessive thinking like, should I go to the store today? Should I try to order it online? What if it doesn't arrive for three weeks and I run out in two? Like it's crazy making. So you're going to have them. I want to make sure that's clear. You're going to have them. But what you want to do is start really becoming aware of that, that you're doing it. So when I start, I, I just tell myself, okay, just stop. Right now in this moment, there's nothing I can do about it. If I want to go to the store, you know, I'll put it on my calendar the next morning. And a lot of times just that act of putting it on my calendar, okay, I'm almost out of whatever it is. I'll put it on the calendar, you know, try Ralph's or try Target or whatever. And then by the next morning, that anxiety has gone. So it's not even really about the item I'm getting low on. I know what it's about, and you probably do too. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's control. All right, so just kind of, again, just, get, just check in with yourself multiple times a day. Think about what you're thinking about. If it's stress generating, then I want you to do any of the things we're gonna talk about today, because the most important thing for your health is to be relaxed so that your immune system keeps recharging and so that you are not worn down and are not stressed out. And then that will help prevent you from getting the virus. So just consider some of these. It's that chatter. We've talked about it before, but it's really intense right now. And again, it's because of the control issue, but it's creating a ton of stress. So the best, the best practice ever is something related to mindfulness. There's lots of contemplative practices. They're all around mindfulness, and that's what helps you calm down those projections of the mind. So pay attention to your thoughts. Notice when you're causing needless stress and anxiety for yourself. When you find your mind wandering to future events, which we're all going to do multiple times a day, just bring yourself back to the present. You're likely to find that in this present moment, you are not actually in a stressful situation. So just stop right this second. Right now, is there anything in this moment to be stressed about? No, we're all hanging out together, right? There's nothing to be stressed about. The stress is from us 
projecting what's going to happen next week. What's going to happen? What do I have to cancel? You know, uh, am I going to be able to get this? Is there going to be a shortage? And those are all future worries that we are making up. Now, I'm not saying don't plan for the future. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I am saying the kind of obsessive thinking that we get going on is not planning. It's just stress inducing. Now, I really encourage you, and I, of course, I've encouraged you for a long time, but now I think it's critical. Develop a practice of meditation, mindfulness, and other contemplative practices, period. It allows us to quiet the mind and to focus on being present. And I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can stay focused on the pre present if you don't start training your brain. And that's what mindfulness and meditation are. They are training the brain. So this can be as simple as taking a few deep breaths. It's, it's very easy to start with and focusing on the now periodically throughout your day. So it's just checking in. What, I'm, what was I just thinking about that I'm feeling so stressed? Oh, I was wondering how long the toilet paper is going to last. Okay, I need to come back to now, right? Just come back to now. There's still some toilet paper, so come back to now. Doesn't mean you can't plan a trip to the grocery store, but there's no reason to start just obsessively worrying about it. So as you continue your practice of staying present, you'll find that these self-inflicted stress inducers minimize, and it really does minimize, and it doesn't take that long. So I'm gonna uh, give you a, an exercise now. We're gonna do it together. So I want you to sit comfortably straight and put your feet flat on the floor. You can rest your hands in your lap. Just be, loosen up, okay? Right now, I want you to loosen up anything you're holding tight, probably your shoulders or your frowning, like let go of these the wrinkles in your forehead, just relax. And the point of this breathing exercise, and this is, you can call this a meditation, you can call it a mindfulness exercise if you hate meditation, it's just a breathing exercise, which ties into all of those. The idea here being, if your thoughts are frantically going crazy, you need something to focus on. And a lot of people have trouble focusing on their breath if they're extremely anxious because they're still thinking of all those crazy things. So you're going to count, right? And you're going to count in a pattern. So we're going to breathe in to a count of four. We're going to hold our breath for a count of seven. And we're going to exhale to a count of eight. And to slowly breathe out that you know, eight count, you can purse your lips like you're blowing up a balloon, okay? And I'll count for you twice, and then I'm going to have you do it in your mind two more times, okay? So let's get started. You can leave your eyes open or closed, whatever you're comfortable with. I prefer closed eyes or gazing down out of focus so that you're not distracted by me or anything else you can see on your screen right now. It's up to you. Okay, so I want you to take in a nice deep breath to a count of one, two, three, four, now hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now you continue in, hold, out, and do it one more time. Great. Now what that does, because you're focusing on those counts and having to remember in and hold and out and the different numbers, it calms the brain down. It focuses it so that it's not going everywhere at one time. Additionally, all that breathing helps turn on your parasympathetic system so that your whole system can calm down. So anytime during the day that you start to feel tense or anxiety rises, just remember four, seven, eight. That didn't take but about a minute, so a minute and a half. So it's an easy exercise. Now, another thing that we really want to do here is we want to recognize our mental patterns. And this is important because another way to reduce the stress is simply to stop looking for it. And I know you're not consciously doing that. 
In Sean Aker's work, and he wrote about it in The Happiness Advantage, he called it the Tetris effect. And basically, they were playing the game that involves patterns. And then they discovered when they went out into the real world, their brain was still looking for the patterns. And that's because that's how our brains work. So our brain is constantly looking for patterns of behavior that can become automatic. Remember, if you participated in any of the habits, uh, the habit workshops that we've done, Anything that can become a habit saves the brain processing power. So the brain loves it. It's always looking for patterns. This benefits us in many ways and saves us lots of processing time that allows us to think about other things. But the downside is, is that the brain can get very stuck in patterns of viewing the world. And right now, that's a problem. So consider what your brain may be looking for without your conscious knowledge. In our work world, we're often rewarded for noticing problems that need to be solved and the stresses that need to be managed, right? That's, that's the key of a lot of our jobs. But if we get stuck in that pattern and we start looking for and picking up all the negatives, the brain stops looking for positives. So pretty soon, the more you're looking for problems, looking for a crisis, looking for stressful things because you're on alert. I mean, that's the ego's job is to look for danger. But if you allow your brain to get into this pattern, you're going to end up really harming your well-being, which could ultimately harm your health. And it's normal, again, during this time, we're, we're definitely all looking for danger. But in fact, most of us are not in danger. Most of us, right? So you want to get yourself out of that pattern. Just check in with yourself right now. Are you constantly scanning the world for problems right now? The likelihood is, is pretty good. Are you constantly scanning for stressors? This is like back to the toilet paper thing. I've got toilet paper finally, but now there's this, you know, <laughs> it's a stressor. Am I scanning for, am I getting low? Is there any on the shelves just in case when I get there, I'm looking for a problem. I don't need to look for a problem, right? I need to focus on now, fine right now. So just check in again with yourself and see if you might be doing that. Now, of course, a very common, uh, common thing that we don't automatically think of is gratitude. We don't think of it when things are going crazy in the world, right? But we can use that pattern searching as a way to develop a more positive outlook. And I know almost all of you have heard me say this because it's, it's, it's an evidence-based study. So, sorry, multiple studies. It's now taught in multiple universities like Yale and Harvard. But we know that looking for three positive things, three things we can be grateful for a day, the number three is important and nobody knows why. For some reason, one and two are okay, but three actually starts changing your neuropathy if you do it every day. If you do a three, three things, you can write it down, you can, I don't, on a piece of paper, you can put it in a jar, you can put it on your computer, whatever feels good for you. But if you do, you do the writing down and, and acknowledging the three good things that you noticed or positive things or things that you're grateful for, the brain will automatically start looking for more. And that's what you're looking for. Instead of looking for how, how empty are the grocery shelves, your, your brain is going to go to, wow, look how full the, what was it the other day? Bread. The bread, the bakery was full at Ralph's yesterday. Okay. Yay. I don't really eat a lot of bread, but yay, it's abundance, right? There's stuff being stocked. So look for that. Okay. So the better you get at scanning for those positives, the more positives you will see without trying. And that's what's important. Habits. Let your brain automatically look for things that are going to support you. Now, no one can, can entirely avoid stressful events. We just can't, but we can deal with them as they occur and continue to focus on the things that are going right. We all have some things going right. I can tell you one, we all have a job, right? There's one right there off the bat. I'm very grateful for that, that we still have our work. That is saving me. I'm busy. I don't have to worry financially that I'm going to you know, be in... in no, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's not ideal, maybe, but it's good. We're grateful. We're, we're blessed. Okay. So recognize also, now here we go. This is one of the biggest problems we're all having. Recognize what is out of your control. This is one of the greatest stressors for people. And especially during this time, because we're feeling out of control of just about everything, right? And we don't ever like to be out of control. So you don't even need to be a control freak to be freaked out by the current loss of control that we have. So feeling we're in control is one of the strongest drivers of well-being. And losing that sense of control is really a lot of what's causing our stress. Now, for some people, it's going to be worse than others. They may be lashing out. They may be feeling helpless. They may be overwhelmed. Um, it can affect their, their motivation. 
Um, I know one of the weirdest things for me that has, it, it's almost like anger is that I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm fine to follow the rules. I'm fine to stay in. I'm fine to figure, you know, figure things out to do things differently. But the one thing that is really just frustrating me to no end is I can't get anything I'm ordering online. <laughs> And, and it's not, I'm not ordering that much online, but I'll need something here, here at the office. Right. And it's, uh, the delivery date is June 15th or the delivery date is August 7th. Like it's way out. Well, am I going to die without those things? No. I mean, I'll just figure out something else to use, but it's that feeling that I've lost control that I, I should have been more prepared or I should have thought of this in advance or it's a control issue. So just recognize I'm sure you all have some of these. Just recognize what's out of your control and understand why, that's, why that upsets us. The key to coping with losing control is simply to really recognize the limitations of our control. You can't control how long we'll be in seclusion. That's one of the biggest ones, of course, for everyone. If they could say right now, even if it was far out, if they said, okay, by August 1st, you'll all be free, we would all feel better because we would know when it's going to quote end. It's not going to work that way. I just saw Governor Newsom yesterday talking about it's not a light switch, it's a dimmer, and they're going to turn it up and down and up and down. So we need to just sort of step back and go, okay, I have no idea how long I'm going to be living this way. And with everybody with different circumstances, that's an important thing to, to look at. If you are crammed into a small space with multiple people, you're going to have to start dealing with how do you do this longer term. If you're home alone, you're going to have to start coming up with strategies to deal with isolation. We've all got different circumstances, but we've all got the same issue, which is we want an answer and we're not going to get it. That makes us feel out of control. We can't control the impact this will have on our jobs. Our jobs may shift and change and you know we may get to go back for a while, then we'll get pulled back again. Like there's all these things that we don't get to control. And of course, you may have a partner or family members who don't even have jobs and that's affecting what you do and how you have to adjust. And again, that's out of your control other than that you have to deal with it. And of course, ruminating over this situation is not going to make it any better. It makes you feel more powerless. It tends to make us think, I wish it was like it used to be right? Now, which way are we going? Instead of worrying about the future, now we're fretting about the past. The past is done. The past is over. Come back to now. What can you do now? So the key to managing the stress of losing control is, a gain, is to gain an accurate understanding of what our possibilities are and what our limits are. So we need to identify what can we control. Make a list, just like this little sample. It honestly helps because if you start to understand, okay, every time your mind starts ruminating over how long is this going to last, look at your list. Oh, I don't have any control over that. Why am I focusing on that? There's nothing I can do about it. You can flip over to your things you have control over. It's, it's, if you stick with this kind of a plan, with focusing on what you can control, your anxiety is going to come down. If you keep resisting what is, the, the lockdown, I shouldn't call it a lockdown, that doesn't sound very positive. Uh, the stay at home, the uh, secluded retreat we're all on. Okay, you don't have control over when that ends. So quit focusing on that. Uh, some of your clients may not want anything to do with you right now because they're afraid and they don't want to be involved in any program and they don't want anybody looking in on them and whatever. You can't control that. You have a lot of clients now that do want that, right? They're fine with it virtual and, and through the phone. So Flip that over. I can control how much time I put into helping those clients that are willing to accommodate the new environment. Don't focus on the ones that don't want your services right now. There's nothing you can do about that. They're going through their own issues. Uh, you can't control some of the things I know that bug me. Going to the uh, oof, going to Costco. Okay, it's no, it used to be an ordeal. I don't go very often. But now it's like I have to block off if I, I've only gone once since we started because it was too long. But a three-hour ordeal just to get toilet paper, right? It was worth it one time, but I don't know about it again. I can control that, right? But I can't control if it's going to be there when I get there. I can't control it. I can only control trying. I can control things like that. So I hope that makes sense. But you got to start splitting it apart. You can't control if, there, if the, what you want or need in the moment is not at a store. You can't control that you can order online, but you can't control when you get the delivery. There's all kinds of things like that right now. And that just makes our brains a little crazy. So accept the things you cannot control and you got to let go of the rest. 
So our current disruptions have made the limits of our control glaringly obvious. And again, that's why we're feeling this anxiety. And it's one of the reasons that people are also scared because we can see now just how much, maybe we were deluding ourselves before, but we can see now we have very little control. So the only way to regain a sense of personal control is to let go of that need for control. And that's called surrender. Now, it does not mean giving up. It means noticing that there, there's nothing that we can do to change the situation, but there are other actions we can take. And there is personal power in action, which again is going back to that list. What do I have control over? And put your energy toward those things. You can also deal with your emotional response in an active way. So you want to, again, this goes back to the very beginning of this presentation, recognize and cope with the emotions that result from whatever the experience is you're having. Don't judge yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't, don't try to be perfect. Just recognize, okay, I am really angry today and I don't know why, or I do know why, whichever it is. And then if you want to sit in that for a minute, sometimes that feels good, right? It's a release of that tension, but then you just don't want to stay there. You need to take action and cope with whatever's coming up for you. You can reframe the situation. So that really does go back to, instead of it being a quarantine, we are in a secluded retreat at home. That may sound silly to you. That does not sound silly to your brain. A secluded retreat does not trigger the sympathetic system to flood you with stress hormones. Quarantine does, right? So just think about the words you're using because they could be really important in the way your system responds. And then, of course, you want to engage in activities that help you cope with the situation. And we'll talk about several of those, but sometimes it's as easy as distraction. Okay, sometimes it's not. So that's why we need more tools. We talked a lot about scheduling when we had the uh, telecommuting webinar. Um, now we're going to talk more about, it's, it, it could still include scheduling, but it's really routine. So again, COVID-19 has completely disrupted our daily patterns, our habits, and our routines. And that not only, again, reduces the feeling of normalcy that we get from our daily habits, but it also means that the brain has to make a ton more decisions. It doesn't like making decisions. That's why it tries to habituate everything. So what's going to happen is, you know, or what has happened is 50% a, a of our lives pre-COVID-19 were habit. We didn't have to think about 50% of the things we did every day. Now what's happened? We have to think about everything. It's not just now, what do I, what do I want for dinner tonight? It's, well, what am I going to eat for the next three weeks? Because I may only get one order and I want to make sure it, span, it spans out, right? There's all these extra decisions. Um, you know, how often should I go out? That's a big decision that we've never had to think about before, right? Or um, how often do you have to rotate tires on a car? <laughs> There's all these new decisions and our brains are on overload. So during these on, this ongoing erup, uh, disruption, every decision we make requires more energy and it makes us feel more uncertain. So reducing the number of daily decisions we have to make about our behaviors is going to reduce stress and anxiety. So the outbreak of the um, virus means we need to focus on our habits. And that means determining which habits you want to maintain and where you need to replace new ones. So are you still working at the office? I know some of you or maybe quite a few of you still are. Then that's great. Whatever it is on rotation, part-time, full-time. I know you're keeping your physical distance, but you want to keep the routine itself because if you're going into the office, the office isn't the same. There's not as many people. You have to make new decisions. Um, communications are different. So you want to keep as much of that routine as you can normal. So wake up at the same time. Drive to work at the same time. If you can go the same way, if you can get in the same parking spot so that you're not making any extra decisions. And then, of course, if you're allowed to follow your work schedule like you normally would, your brain is going to relax. Are you working from home? Wake up at the same time as you did when you're working in the office if you're still having trouble. If you've, if you've acclimated to your schedule, then again, just like we said before, you can kind of, you know, uh, back it off a little or treat yourself, be kind to yourself. But if you're struggling, get back on that strict schedule. And then, of course, you can replace the time that you used to commute with a new habit, but make it a habit. So whether it's to go for a walk or clean up the house or... Uh, make a big breakfast or spend time with your family before your workday starts. It doesn't matter what it is, but you want to create a habit in that commute time. And that's not a habit of sitting down and watching the news for that hour. You want to make a healthy habit that's, you know, recharging, regenerating. 
rejuvenating, anything that's going to kind of help you get your day started, but do it every day. And once you do it every day for two, three weeks, it'll become a habit. Now, the other thing you can do is replace habits that you can't do now, but with something similar. And, you know, again, you're going to look back at what was your pattern. Remember, because we're looking to eliminate decisions. What was your pattern pre-COVID-19? Okay. So if you always went maybe on the way home from work, you went to the gym. I know a lot of you do that. Or maybe you stopped off at the store on your way home. Or you went to happy hour with friends. So you want to replace those habits that you've lost. Because, again, every time that, that period comes up, your brain is looking for, now what do I do with that time? Replace it with something similar. So instead of going to the grocery store, give it a shot to try online. It's hit and miss, I know, but that's your time to go online and see if you can find any store that's going to deliver what you need. So you're still shopping, right, for your needs. Um, if you go to the gym normally after work, then make it a habit that the minute you come home from work, that's when you work out. So go for a run, put in a, a video. You know, uh, there's all kinds of online apps now that from the gyms that where they're, you know, doing the exercises online. So just do that. Replace that however you long. If you worked out an hour, work out an hour. So you're still following the same pattern. And if you went to happy hour every Wednesday night with your pals, either from work or outside, then have one virtually, you know, don't drink too much, but you could still have a happy hour. I've done two now. It's actually not that weird. <laughs> it's a little weird, but it's not that weird. And you can then again, connect with your friends or family that way. So if you normally went out for a glass of wine on Wednesday night, then have the glass of wine and get your friends on virtually. Have your wine. You'll feel normal. Okay. Now, if you do have things that you did before that just cannot be replaced, okay, then you need to create a new habit. And that's possible, right? So there are some things that you just can't do anymore. If you went, you know, if you went for a massage after work on every Friday, you can't have that now. So find something else that you can uh, replace that with that's, that's, that does kind of, this, that gives you the same reward. So if you remember, it's cues, routines, rewards. You're looking for that reward. So maybe it's to come home and take a bubble bath, or maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, to stretch or do yoga, something where you're doing something kind of similar. Anything that's going to reduce that anxiety. Another thing that you can do is to get into the flow. And so the flow is really where you are in this, it's called in the zone a lot. People, sports people say it that way. They're in the zone. It means time slows down. You don't think of anything else but the thing you're working on. And you can do it literally for hours and time just seems to stop. Like you're usually surprised at how much time has passed. And the reason this is important is it's going to really activate your right brain hemisphere, right? Right hemisphere of the brain, because you want to have that creative juice coming through, but you also want, when you're in that state, you are in almost a state of bliss or a state of peace. And we could use that respite right now. So think in terms of what is something that you've done where you've experienced that, whatever it is, I can't tell you what it is, but where, where I know for me, pottery, like uh, throwing pottery, I used to do that. I do that a lot when I'm writing. I'll think I'm just going to write for an hour and then I'll look up at the clock and it's been four hours. When you're in that state, you are not worrying about the outside world. You're not worrying about the past or the future. You're in the flow. So if you can think of something, the last time that you ever felt like that, maybe it was reading a great novel. Maybe it was uh, laying in the hammock in the sun. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just think in terms of when did you experience that feeling of time stopped? Uh, some people love numbers. That is not my thing for getting in the flow, but it is for some people. So whatever it is, maybe it's doing a puzzle. Give yourself some of that time. Maybe not every day, but maybe once a week where you say, this is my flow time and I'm just going to get completely absorbed into an activity. It's really good for your brain. Of course, there's tapping out anxiety. Uh, we've talked about tapping and we've done, I've done a lot of little demos because we never have time to really delve too far into it. Now I'm going to tell you, this is serious. <laughs> Tapping is actually the, one of the best things you can do. Mindfulness is the best foundation you can establish to deal with anxiety, but tapping is a way to discharge negative emotions. And the reason it is, I am strongly now recommending that you try it is because it is uh, proven to eliminate the, the symptoms of PTSD. Okay, so that is as stressed out basically as you can be. And if veterans can use it to eliminate those symptoms that they've been trying to get rid of, some of them for 20 or 30 years, if we use it, you can just sort of extrapolate out why that would be so beneficial. So 
this is again related to acupressure for any of you who don't understand it. And um, it's, it's a combination of modern psychology. It's like self-talk therapy with uh, tapping on acupressure points. And again, you use your fingers. Um, you don't need any equipment. You, it's not acupuncture. You don't need any needles, but it's basically a, a way of tapping on the uh, endpoints of the body, the meridian endpoints, while focusing on the negative emotions. So this is the one. This is the one practice that I teach that it's be as negative as possible. And then you want to, um, as you do it, you're going to calm your nervous system, and it starts to rewire the brain to respond in healthier ways. So it has been studied and studied and it's still under clinical trials, but there are already a lot of published studies. It's been proven to be effective to resolve a range of issues, including stress and anxiety. So I really want you to understand how this works. When we're experiencing a negative emotional state, the brain's process, it's the natural stress response kicks in. That's our fight or flight. All of the body's defense systems are turned on, right? There goes your adrenaline, the cortisol, the heart, the breathing, everything starts racing, right? To get you ready to fight or to run. It's as simple as that. Uh, research out of Harvard uh, Medical School shows that the stimulation of certain meridian points decreases activity in the amygdala. That's where the response comes from, the stress response. In addition to other parts of the brain associated with fear. In fMRI and PET, brain scans can actually see the activity some, hang on one second here. I'm hearing some noise. Let me make sure everybody's muted. Okay. Um, in the, in uh, the brain scans, you can actually see the activity in the amygdala calm down and calming down uh, as, as those acupressure points are tapped on. It just calms the brain down. Don't we need that right now? So, and now I'm frozen. Okay. Uh, in another study, cortisol levels of participants that engaged in an hour-long tapping session dropped between 24 and 50 percent, while those that engaged in just talk therapy with no tapping or they received no treatment at all showed no sig significant um, changes in their cortisol levels. In case you've forgotten, cortisol is what packs on that muffin top. So if you're not interested in helping your brain, then maybe you're interested in helping your body. So through tapping, you're sending the signal to your brain that you are calm, that this current situation does not evoke any remote emotional response from you. Wouldn't that be lovely to relax right now? So we're going to do this together. I have a video up. If you're not able wherever you are right now to do this, you can just watch. Um, but I have posted a video on tapping on anxiety on our YouTube channel. So you can just click on the YouTube icon on any of my emails under the signature. It's right there. You can just click. You go right to our YouTube. All right, so what I want you to do now is I want you to check in with yourself and I want you to consider, and maybe right this moment, you might be feeling less anxious because we're all together talking about it, but I want you just to check in on a scale of zero to 10, how anxious do you feel? Zero being you've totally chilled out, you're fine, and 10 being the world is coming to an end. Okay, so whichever, wherever you are in that spectrum. And then I want you to take in a deep breath and I want you to sigh with relief. And again, just relax. And we're going to begin on the karate chop. So it's right. If you were chopping, you know, doing the karate chop, you know, chopping wood right there. And then you're just going to take the other hand. It doesn't matter which hand. And you're just going to gently tap. And I use all four fingers and you just gently you're not beating yourself up. You're going to gently tap and you're going to repeat after me. Even though I feel so anxious, I accept myself as I am. Even though I hate feeling nervous all the time, I accept myself just as I am. Even though I feel stressed out to the max, I accept myself just as I am. Okay, and then you're gonna to go to the first point, which is where the eyebrow starts. And you can, again, use as many fingers, both hands, it doesn't matter, as long as you're hitting one side or the other or both near where the eyebrow starts. All of this anxiety, repeat after me. And switch over to the temple point, side of the eye. All of this anxiety, 
and just repeat the words after I say them and tap where I'm tapping. Then go under the eye, right on the bone. I am so tired of feeling anxious. Then go under the nose. It's exhausting. Then under the lip, I feel anxious all of the time. And it's okay if that's not true for you. You can still say it. It won't hurt you. And then go down to where the V is in your neck, over about an inch and down an inch. You've got two indents down here, one side, both sides, all of this anxiety. Then the next point is under your arm, even with your bra strap or about four inches from the armpit. All of this anxiety. And I pat because that's tender for me, but you can tap or pat. The final is the crown of your head. All of this anxiety. Now, if you do this at home, you're going to keep going, right? So anxiety. And you can say anything you like that comes up for you. I'm just going to say anxiety. So say anxiety. Under your eye, tension. Under your nose, I just want life to be normal. Under your lip, say whatever's coming up for you. I do not like this situation. Collarbone point, all of this anxiety. Under your arm, too much anxiety. Crown of your head, everything creates tension. Now you would keep going. <coughs> Pardon me, I gotta get a drink of water. You would keep going with that. You could say things like, I hate going to the grocery store. I'm scared to take a walk. Um, I have to go to the doctor. I'm so nervous about going into a doctor's office. I'm so anxious about what I'm running out of. Uh, you, whatever you're experiencing, you just keep going around to those eight points and you continue to do that at least six times, eight times around. And at the end of that time, you're going to pause and you're going to go back and you're going to check in again. How am I feeling now on a scale of zero to 10? Now, if you started out at a 10, we have a lot of people at a 10 right now. That's because of this uncertainty and the lack of control, which hopefully you're going to start getting control of now. Um, you're going to get control of your lack of control. But as you uh, do around the rounds, like so every point is a round, and as you do six, seven, eight rounds, when you check in, if you started at a 10 and it's come down to a nine or an eight, keep going because you've got more to get out of you. And you can say terrible things. You can swear, I, you can say, this is the only time I will ever tell you, be as negative as you can be. Because what are you trying to get rid of? Negativity, so let it out. You can talk about, you know, you're anxious about the people that you're living with, you're anxious about other people's behavior, whatever is causing you anxiety. Loss of control, doesn't matter, just how you're feeling. So you're gonna do that, you're gonna check in. Now, if you, so, so if you're at an eight or 10, like you're eight or nine, even a seven, seven, eight or nine, you definitely wanna do another six or eight rounds. Then after you've done that, check in again. What should happen over time, and it may take five or six rounds if it's really intense, then you can, um, you can keep doing it until you get down to, if you get down to a zero or one, you're not anxious about, whatever you were tapping on anymore. Now, you may have other anxieties. Maybe you want to do it for everything you're anxious about, one at a time. That's absolutely brilliant, and you will start to lower your anxiety all over the place. But if you just want general anxiety, this will get it down. So even once you're down below a five, you'll find that you're better able to self-regulate. When you're at a 10, it's pretty difficult to self-regulate. A 10 means really you kind of want to cry all the time. You're just so tense, right? If we're talking about anxiety, but whatever the emotion is, it means it's so ramped up that you're being flooded with those hormones that prevent you from effectively self-regulating. So you want to get it down to a five or lower. And once you're down to a five or lower, even if you still feel a little bit, you're going to start to feel that you can control it better. If you're trying to really resolve a specific issue, like you're, maybe you're home alone and you're afraid of being home alone, then you can tap specifically on the anxiety around that 
and you'll have to keep going until it gets down to a zero, a one or a zero. And you don't have to do it all in one day. You can make it a habit, tap once a day, or ha make it a habit to tap at the end of each day, whatever works for you. But we need real tools to effectively manage the levels of anxiety that we're experiencing. So I highly encourage you to try it if you haven't tried it. And if you've only been doing it the way, like, you know, in the little demos I give you where just to calm down, you tap your collarbone point. That's still great to help you calm down. But to really calm down, you need to do the entire sequence. So yeah, you got to dedicate a little bit of time to it, but it's worth it because it helps you relax. And again, I'll take questions at the end. And if, if you uh, don't want to ask on this format, you can email me if you have specific questions about specific issues, how you should tap on those. Okay. Now, this one's my, I'm really having trouble with this, I, I confess. And it's not a four-letter word for me. I, I like exercise. It, my issue now is I'm having, I'm having some challenges managing my time well, so I keep uh, bumping the exercise. So whether it's that you don't like it or that your schedule is it's making it hard, you know, there's people around and you're trying to get too much stuff done. I feel like I'm on Zoom all day long every day. How am I going to exercise? I made it a priority again last week. So, because honestly, I'm starting to think like if I was younger, it would look like I'm getting ready to give birth. The stomach's getting bigger, the hips are spreading. It's not a good sign. So I'm going to start exercising more. So one of the keys though, if you hate it, is pick an activity that you don't hate. Okay, just pick something you don't hate doing. There's got to be some kind of movement that you don't hate. And then don't worry about increasing the intensity or the amount you, that you do. So stop and think right now, what is something that you could do that you don't hate? An easy one for most people, <coughs> excuse me, is dancing. Dancing is a form of exercise. So if you don't hate dancing, then make that your exercise. Now, health professionals are always telling us we need to exercise 150 weeks. And I'm sure they're right. I'm not criticizing them, but I never have time to do the amount they recommend. So I'm going to say, if you're currently doing zero minutes a week, then anything is better than nothing. So don't worry about what the professionals are saying. Anything is better than nothing you've got to get up and move. And this is no joke, not just for your body. Our, our minds need us to get up and move. So when you begin to feel the mood changing results of your exercise, then you may want to increase it, right? Maybe you're dancing and you start feeling great and you think, oh, I'm going to dance for an hour. Okay, great if you want to. But maybe you don't. Again, that's okay. Don't feel pressure to become a world-class athlete. I have heard people on the radio and on podcasts saying, now is your time to get in athletic shape. And now I don't know where, what they're doing. I don't have time to become a super athlete right now. I just want to be healthy. So that's all I'm recommending for you. And if you want to go further, go for it. But you need to move your body and you'll start to feel and enjoy the results, including, especially for me, mental health. So I am making myself, no matter how busy I am, no matter what is scheduled, every day I am taking a walk. The only accommodation I make is sometimes I, I have a full hour that I could actually walk. And some days I, it can only be 20 minutes because I, I've only got a half an hour between Zoom sessions. At least I'm getting 20 minutes of getting outside, which is also good for you, and moving. Very important. You can also make exercise a moving meditation. So for those of you that don't like meditation, there is still a way to tie this into building your mindfulness practice. So rhythmic exercises quickly induce the relaxation response. That's the opposite or the fight or flight, right? So they quickly induce that, which is very healthy for your mind and body. And again, that could be anything rhythmic. It could be running. So you run, at, run or walk at a certain pace so you don't you're not meandering, you're building that rhythm so that your body starts to relax. If you have a pool, I'm jealous. And yes, swimming is a rhythmic um, activity, which would be great. Dancing, yoga, tai chi. There's lots of movements that you can make to a rhythm. And that's going to really boost your um, relaxation response. But it also is, it helps you become more mindful. So as you're walking or as you're running or as you're swimming, you can actually also include mindful exercises. So perhaps it's focusing on your breath. What is your breath like as you're walking? Do you notice as it starts to build? I can tell when I've been walking for a half an hour now without a watch or anything, because if I'm walking at a fast clip after half an hour, I start to notice my breathing is becoming more labored, right? Um, so it's just paying attention. There's nothing wrong with that, but pay attention to it. Pay attention to how your body feels. You can pay attention to how your body um, moves. Like you pay attention to things like um, if you're outside walking, pay attention to the air hitting your face 
or if you're wearing a mask, hitting your forehead. But is it like as you're running or walking, it's going to feel different, right? You can feel, I can always feel it on my arms, on my arm hairs. That's the detail you want to focus on. That's going to, again, build your mindful muscles and it's going to help you relax. And then you want to focus on coordinating your breath with movements, right? So in yoga, if you do yoga, then you know what I'm talking about. But basically when you move one way, so maybe when you take a right step, you breathe in. And when you take a left step, you breathe out. That's like a simple example. You want to get it in sync with your movements. Now you can also use exercise to fulfill other needs. So are you in need of some alone time? I am right now. So you can use your new commitment to exercise as a way to get out of the house and have some me time. If you are home with other people and they are in your face, not on purpose, it's not their fault, but they're all there underfoot, it's very important that you make sure you have some downtime away from other people. So you can say, I'm taking a walk, right? Uh, or I'm going to go uh, do yoga and I need quiet. But it's an excuse that then you're not hurting somebody's feelings. You may have the opposite problem. Perhaps you've got a bunch of household members and they're all in different corners of the house or in their rooms with the doors closed on their devices. So it's a way to bring people together and you can exercise together. And that's motivating for those in the house that maybe aren't self-motivated to do it. Now, home alone. A lot of us are home alone. A lot of us are too many people. <laughs> There's no ideal situation right now. But if you are home alone, you are not alone. There are a lot of people in self-isolation right now. So I see them every day as I'm out walking or as they walk by my house. They're going out for walks and jogs. They're trying to maintain a contact with neighbors with still keeping that physical distance, which is a great idea. So you can't get up close and personal maybe with people around your neighborhood or in your community, but you can wave, you can smile, you can say hello, you can connect, and you're also getting some exercise. So it's excellent for your well-being and health. Another thing you can do is try decluttering your space. Um, it's, it's a, this is a control thing, right? It's a control exercise. You can't control so much and you feel chaotic. So if you can control your space, it has a calming effect. And it's interesting that um, I did not believe this when I saw this, I, when I first read this, honestly, because I, I tend to be very orderly. And I thought, well, I'm certainly not going to get all sloppy and messy now because I can't stand a mess. And oh my gosh, it's not good. <laughs> Today, when I'm done with everything, it's uh, my bedroom's got to be decluttered. I don't know why. I guess it's just, it's, it's evidently common, but we start to let things just slip. You know, it's like, oh, well, and part of mine is because no one's coming here now. It's like, well, who's going to see my room? Who cares? I care. I need to go in there and fix it. That will make me feel calmer. So we've talked about control and of course, um, how a lot of our anxieties have to do with the loss of those feelings of uncertainty. So directing our energy toward getting something under control is the best way to cope with those feelings. If you're feeling out of control, then change this by reducing the chaos in your environment. <clears throat> Start with something small. Again, you don't want to take on any big projects right now. Unless you are just really feeling great about this, maybe this fit into your long-term plans. <laughs> Otherwise, everything's got to be little. Don't put pressure on yourself. But you want to find like a, a, an impactful place. Where do you spend a lot of time? Probably your workspace. If it's all out of control now, this now that is one thing I've had to stop several times in the last few weeks and keep redoing. It's like it was getting out of control. And that's because, and probably for a lot of us, I was accustomed to working with my staff in here. We had a rhythm going. I kept everything very neat and clean for them a lot, I guess, more than myself. And then now they're not here. And I'm like, oh, well, I keep stacking things up on the multiple desks because no one's sitting there. That's terrible. Don't do that. Then I have to go back there and clean it all up. So start there. You can just spend five minutes at first to get it started. And again, it's just going to help you start feeling like you're a little more in control a little calmer, a little less chaotic. Whatever space you start with, consider it permanently a clutter-free zone. So nothing should be placed back in that space unless it's actually in use. So I've been like um, very, very difficult to live with regarding this in my, on my kitchen counter. I have a big counter and I need it clean. I have always needed it clean. I don't like clutter on that counter. And so now it's like the second someone else puts something there, I'm like, ah, not on that space. <laughs> So it is a clutter-free zone and it makes me feel good. So you find yours and work on it. And again, five minutes a day, just start clearing out the clutter. Um, also pay attention to the effect it has on your mental state. You'll see it pays off. Okay, so this sounds like a simple thing, but it's powerful. You also want to do a little 
take a little self-care inventory. So we talk, we throw that word around all the time, self-care, self-care. Well, you know, we've all got to practice self-care, but what does it really mean? And most of us think it means to eat well, exercise, sleep, and of course, connect with others in a meaningful way. And it is that. Um, and these are things that everyone could apply to their lives and see an upswing in their physical and mental well-being. But self-care also includes personal and individualized activities that bring you pleasure. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, baking a cake could be a form of self-care for you. And that's the part I really want to talk about. Self-care is not the same for everybody. I mean, we all need sleep and exercise and we need, you know, that's like a given. But real self-care means you know what to do to make you happy. And so what is that? And can you do it under these circumstances? Can you find those things? It's so funny. I used to cook a lot. And that's one of the things I've been trying to start again because I cut it out for years. It's too time consuming. So now I'm like, I have nothing to do in the evenings. I might as well get back into cooking. And then, and I've never been a good baker. I'm a great cook. I'm a terrible baker. So I thought, okay, maybe this is, you know, that's what I'll do in the evening. Try to bake. And of course, I finally found flour that took three and a half weeks. I can't find yeast. I wanted to bake bread. So I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> but it's a process, right? It may not make me feel good. Baking might be a, not a form of self-care. I'm not good at it. So I don't know yet if I'm going to get aggravated or I'm going to feel good that I'm building a skill. But I know cooking is, I, I get lost in cooking. It's creative. I get into a, the flow. Like I get going with something. So that's a form of self-care. I'm suggesting that you find yours. What is something that you can do that you, it, it just makes you feel good. It makes you feel happy. So pay attention for the next week. Just jot down. I really felt good while I was doing that. Maybe it's cleaning the bathroom because it's, you never had time to do that before. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe it doesn't matter what it is. Just take note of when do you feel really good and when do you feel stressed? And you want to start replacing those feeling stress times with doing something that makes you feel good. Um, it's also, uh, it, it, this may be the first time you've really thought about it this way. So it's easy to like rattle off a list. Like I said, oh, I, I have to get eight hours sleep. I have to exercise for 30 minutes a day. That's not the same thing that we're talking about. So it may be challenging at first. And that's why I'm saying pay attention. If you suddenly notice like, oh, I feel so good. What was it that made you feel good? Okay, write that down. And that's what you're going to start using for self-care. <coughs> now, this all starts with ourselves period. There's no way around this. So we only have control of ourselves, right? We can't control other people. We cannot change other people. We cannot control outside circumstances and we cannot change those circumstances. But I want you to keep in mind that anxiety management sounds like this all me, me, me. You know, it's like the self-absorbed thing. But when we eliminate stress and anxiety from the inside out, we're addressing our outlook on life and that is going to affect how we interact with the world. Remember, our behavior, our emotions, they're contagious. So our habits, thoughts, all of that spread through our interactions in a complicated web. And I think we've now seen in some ways that we maybe never thought of how connected we all are, even if we're not physically together. So if we can get sort of like get ourselves together, then we are going to be of much more service way beyond what we might imagine. When you use these tools to make positive changes in your life, you're unconsciously changing the behavior of an incredible number of people. I will tell you, I got, I get some lovely emails. I do from within the program and from outside. And I got a, an email that just stopped me like in my tracks last night. And it was from a woman. I don't know where she lives here in the United States, but she's from Brazil and she wanted her, uh, her brother in Brazil to be able to listen to the podcast because it has helped her so much through this experience. And I was like, okay, if I wasn't staying mindful and staying calm, because you know, the, producing that thing is stressful. <laughs> so I thought, well, if I wasn't, if I hadn't been doing my own practice, I would never know that somebody I've never met has been helped by listening to something I said and who knows what I said at that time and, it, and then is spreading it to somebody that lives in another country. That's kind of what I mean. There's this ripple effect that we, we have no clue of, what's, of what happens with what we do in the world. So let's get calm. Let's get well, despite what's going on. We can do that. And then we are going to have that ripple effect. So in your own lives, think of this, like how many, how many people could be affected by you changing your patterns. So of course, any partners you live with or their, their siblings, did you think about that? Like if your partner, if you, have a, if you have a significant other, if that person's feeling better because you've changed your patterns, then they can spread that in their own way 
to their siblings, maybe their parents, maybe their coworkers, of course, your own parents, your own family. When you are assisting your clients, you're not just supporting them. It's spreading to their children. It could be spreading to the children's friends. You don't know where it goes. Your own children. Can you imagine the effect you could be having on your own children that could then affect their teachers that are struggling trying to teach them remotely? Their classmates, their classmates' parents. So I really want you to think that we are each a drop in this ripple and we get to choose what that ripple is. It's very powerful. Now, here's, the, here's my only lecture part, really lecture. The rest I just am asking you to do for your own good. But this is it. How many times have you read a self-help book? You attend a webinar, and I don't just mean mine, I, anybody's. You attend a webinar or a workshop, you read books, you read articles, and you do nothing with it. You think it's a great, you do this, whoo, that felt good, and then you go right back to what you were doing before. So I am telling you that everything that we just talked about is an evidence-based practice known to relieve anxiety. So just do it. You have to pick one or pick them all, but don't just leave in about 20 minutes or 15 minutes and say, that was great. And then don't do any of these practices, please. We have to normalize at this point. Now, one of the biggest problems with this, really, it's not that you don't want to. I mean, some of it's self-motivation, but a lot of times it's just, you can't remember to do it. So sticky notes, phone alerts, a piece of jewelry can be very effective. So whether you're a, a male or female, if you put a bracelet on or a watch that you don't normally wear, every time you see it, make it the reminder, oh, I need to get up and move, for example. Now, this reminder, I think, is a beautiful reminder. Um, so easy to do if you get in the habit. Get in this habit of noticing every time you touch a door handle. And of course, be sanitary. Wipe it off if other people are around. <laughs> but every time you reach for a handle, as you press or turn that handle, I want you to ask yourself, how am I handling my feelings right now? Get it? Handle, handle. I want, that's an easy habit to make. Okay, so, and that's an easy reminder. I'm going to say it again. Even though it's a cliche, we are not in a sprint. We are in a very long marathon. So it is important that you get enough rest. That is when your immune system recharges, right? So in addition to focusing mentally, we need our bodies to be performing at peak performance. Pause and take care of yourself whenever you need to, regardless of how busy you are. doesn't matter. If you're too busy, everybody wants something, you still, if you feel you need a break, you have to take a break. We highly encourage you to join our Home Visiting Heroes Facebook group because we can send regular reminders to you that way without flooding your e email. Um, and we'll have updates on maintaining your well-being. We'll have links to all kinds of support services and systems. So please join it if you haven't already. You join it by just sending us an email that uh, allows you to receive a notification from Facebook. So some of your work emails may not do that. Practice mindfulness, meditation, and self-compassion. And then I want you to practice gratitude when you can, even for unpleasant things. We've talked about this before. When do you really learn a lesson? When something's going wrong. So look around at something that is unpleasant and look at what could you learn from that and be grateful for it. We don't like being uncomfortable at all. But if we can start learning to accept that now we're going to have to be uncomfortable at least some of the time, we can start being grateful for the fact that we're learning to sit in our own discomfort without it causing massive anxiety. Now, in addition uh, to the Home Visiting Heroes, uh, we do have a podcast on mindfulness and people are finding it very helpful in relaxing. So I encourage you, if you've never tried a podcast, just give it a try. It does help calm you down. Uh, I am going to go through a few of these resources really quickly, and then I'll open it up for questions. But I do want to point out a few things. Number one, uh, by the way, A Mindful Moment, which is the podcast, is included on Apple's COVID-19 Essential Listening Collection. They went around and collected all the podcasts they thought were helpful for people to deal through this crisis. So in addition to ours, um, there's a lot of other podcasts on there that you might find very beneficial about being isolated, about the, there's podcasts for the news that might be more reliable than watching TV. So there's a whole bunch in the collection. So I highly recommend you check that out on Apple. Uh, GTHX, I've mentioned a couple of times this app for, that was for iPhone, but now um, it's for iPhone and Android. And it was a subscription service and now they've made it free because of the pandemic. So it's called GTHX and it's a mindful practice that's completely focused only on gratitude. 
So I highly recommend that. I do also want to point out that I've shared other apps with you on mindfulness, but Headspace is currently offering their entire program free to healthcare professionals and educators. So I think all of you should qualify for that. Additionally, mental health resources. Many of us are going to have at least periods of time where we really might sink a little too low. Some of us may have a general decline and some of us may just really be struggling. So if you do not want to go physically to a therapist, something like that, I've put these resources in here for you. They are either apps or they're telehealth services for mental health. So I highly encourage you to check that out. Again, a lot of them have either low, lower uh, prices than normal or they have free versions or they have a, like in the Aura app, which is sleep and mindfulness. They have, uh, you get three months free with this password. And again, this, you'll have access to this PowerPoint so you can look these up. Again, the tapping uh, uh, demo for anxiety is that link is here and you can also go to the tapping solution to learn to tap on more issues. We've included some exercising at home, some more. We're gonna add more and more every time because we know we all need it. We've got some parenting tips, better ways to cope with COVID-19 than just yelling at the top of your lungs, which I know some people feel like at this point. Um, decluttering to help you with that. And then um, in your neighborhood, I also just want to point this out. If you're not familiar, Facebook turned on their, um, they already had a helping page, I guess, which I never knew about community help, but they have uh, created one called COVID support and it's really a uh, geographic based. So if you need something, um, you can go on there and it covers uh, from a six to a 50 mile radius. So if you need something, you can post it there and people will and believe me, they will. You'll hear from people saying, I'll help you with that, or I, I've got extra of that, and vice versa. You can help other people. Nextdoor.com, I sometimes love it, sometimes hate it, but right now I do love it because same thing. People are posting, look, does anybody have toilet paper? Three neighbors will say, I do. I'll put a, I'll put a roll on the porch for you. Other people are saying, does any, can anybody find this and that? Can anybody run to the drugstore for me? And instantly people are responding. So if you need help, Use those two services. Again, all of this is free or reduced price. And um, these uh, finding help in your neighborhoods, they include a help map so you can actually mark where you are so somebody can see how far away they are or vice versa. So it's very helpful. Let's use technology to its fullest right now. All right, we made it to the end. I am going to, give me one second, I'm going to open this back up so I can see you.